Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I'm gonna chat with Jason Taylor, JT, who was the first person on what would later be called Team Fallout. Hi, JT. Hey, how's it going, Tim? I'm good, how are you? Great. It has been a long time. You came to see the talk at GDC. Yeah, like 10 years ago, you were in town and I was, I believe I was working in San Francisco at the time. Uh, and then we met up and chatted. I saw your we presentation, it was good. We had lunch afterwards, but I remember I didn't know you were gonna be there and you were in the front. And I was like, I have to stay honest now because he's <laughs> right there like. I, yeah, I don't remember you saying anything that made me wanna jump out of my chair, so. Well, that's why I told Leonard, this is why I like doing it because I have my notes and I have everything, but a lot of this is perspective based. And I find that sometimes I'll leave a meeting with someone and we have a very different take on what someone literally just said. So as, as the person who started right away in the very, like I got started in early 94 and then in fall 94, you and Jason Anderson started, I think the same week, but I think you actually started before him and you and I yep. shared an office. Yep. So I kind of wanted you to talk about very early, it was, Team GURPS back then. Right. What was that? What, what was it like? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, what was your impression of this starting project? Um, well, let's see. It was it was already GURPS before I joined. I know you had been doing, like, you had been working on an engine. Um, and <clears throat> I had heard through the grapevine um, that you wanted to do a GURPS game. And I was really into GURPS, and so I lobbied to get on the team. So I was just happy to be there as a starting point. But also, it, um, it was, though I had done some coding on a couple other projects, which I can talk about um, later on, um, I hadn't really, like, worked on a game from the beginning and, you know, in, in, in a, like, real big boy programmer capacity. Um, so I was real excited uh, to join the team, but but the team was just you. <laughs> Do you remember, how did you get on it? Because I remember I asked for people and Alan said, everybody's busy. So how did you do it? I'm not sure. Um, I had, so th th I had previously done, um, a, well, a couple different things. I guess, let me go back and talk about my interplay journey before I got onto the team. So um, I started out in customer service. Um, and the reason <laughs> the reason I even knew about the job was because um, I used to work at Egghead Software. And- um, With who? Well, um, shoot, uh, Scotty had worked at Egghead Software, but he had, he had worked there before I did. So, <clears throat> In any, so he, I didn't know him, whatever. This is in Brea, California. Um, so I got a job at Egghead Software, I'd worked there for a while. And I don't know, six months later, um, Scotty shows up at the store because he was still, he was friends with people that worked there. And he brought a demo of Out of This World that had, I think it had, wasn't released yet. And he's like, hey, um, our, I didn't work on this, but our company worked on this. And I was blown away like A, that I was talking to a game developer, you know, that I didn't think that that could be a thing. And then B, like the company was local. <laughs> yeah. And somebody that worked at a software, you know, as a software salesman in retail got a job there. So like my, just my, uh, the wheel started spinning in my head. But any, and also the game was super good. I, I love that game. Sarah so Chucky um, made that, it was a really good game. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, later that year, uh, a few months later, <clears throat> I was into bulletin boards and I was poking around and I saw that Interplay had a bulletin board and I was like, oh, let's check out what's going on. And they had like job, you know, job postings on it. And one of them was customer service. And, you know, the list of stuff was, or the list of requirements was like, you know, DOS skill and blah, blah, blah. And having worked, you know, being a computer science major and working in a software store and basically doing tech support for customers that can't install WordPerfect or whatever. Um, I was like, I wonder if I could do that. Um, so I ended up applying, I got the job and I worked in customer service for a while, eventually moved to QA. And then as is the case, in, even in the game industry today, um, people in QA often get plucked to do menial development tasks and then eventually you know, make their way up. So um, 
I first got pinged for um, Bill Dugan was working on um, Star Trek 25th anniversary enhanced CD-ROM. And basically the, it, it was just, well, I, and in fact, I've got props. <laughs> oh the, yeah. I've got code in there. He needs a little bit of code. <laughs> yeah. Um, the work was basically, it was like, you know, a Sierra style adventure game, walk around talk to people, whatever. Um, and the, the CD-ROM version, because this was like CD-ROM was new and we have all the space now. So they got um, the uh, voice recordings of the original actors to do all the dialogue in the game. And, you know, they didn't redo the game. Basically, they just hacked <laughs> hacked the engine so that any time a text string showed up on the, str on the screen, there was like a code at the beginning of it. It like in the text file, it was like hashtag file name hashtag or something like that so anytime the engine showed text it would say do you have a file named that and then we play it um and so high tech it was yeah <laughs> and so they needed i don't remember what my title was but it was basically production assistant it was like here's all the text in the game here's all the files um here's the script with uh like the studio script with notes of like when things changed or whatever and <laughs> and then my job was to like <laughs> play every sound or, or look at every text string and play every sound associated with it and make sure that they matched and in some cases if like the words were slightly different i'd edit the text file anyway it was like you didn't go back to the voice actor and demand a reshoot <laughs> we did not uh yeah so so i did that for a few months i don't know and then eventually that shipped uh and i didn't do a terrible job so then later i got asked to do some actual coding on another star trek game which was the super nintendo starfleet academy and um with daryl daryl hawkins am i remembering that name programmer um he did the snes version because yeah Don price did the pc version yeah i, I think, think you're right i think you're right yeah Daryl had done the, the SNES version, and I'm sure the PC version was quite a bit different. But in any case, um, he had written the engine. He had like modeled the, you know, 3D modeled the ships and he basically did everything. Um, but they needed somebody to script the missions. And um, that was uh, 68,000 assembly language, <laughs> which you know, I had never done assembly language before. But like it was, it was basically like setting flags and doing basic math but it was like all assembly coded and it was to implement the design, which was like, if you go to this sector, flip this flag, if you do this, then it activates this enemy, change the AI when this happens. It was like, it was simple stuff, but like- But still, hard. assembly language is low. Yeah, and I had never done it before, so um, that was challenging, but I, I also didn't screw that up apparently. Um, <laughs> and then um, I think it was after that that, I heard about GURPS and asked to be on it, but I wasn't allowed to because they needed people to work on Stonekeep. <laughs> Everybody was working on Stonekeep. Yeah, and, and I think, let's see, I think the deal was I had to work on Stonekeep for a month or something like that uh, to help out. And then I was taking vacation. And then when I got back from vacation, um, then I could work on Groups. You know, I just remembered I got pulled onto Stonekeep. Oh, yeah. And I'm wondering if that was part of a deal. Because I just remember one day Tom was still the producer on on this project until he things exploded and he had too many things. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, and he said, They need you over in Stonekeep. And I'm like, but I'm the only one on it. <laughs> Nothing will happen. And he said, it's just for they had problems reading the CD ROM data. And it was like, and it was assembly code I had to write. I had to do an interrupt handle. So I did that and then came back. And maybe that's when you came on board too. Yeah, that sounds right. And then uh, and then I moved into your office. And so I guess to get back to your original question, um, what was it like? <laughs> the, the pace was maybe different than the other projects that I had worked on because like it was just you and me. And um, I, I remember, I got, or my title when I joined the product uh, project was lead scripter. <laughs> yeah, but you were really doing code on the world editor. Yeah, but but like the day that I joined, there was no scripting language. <laughs> there was nothing to script. <laughs> so I was lead scripter for a real long time without doing any scripting. 
it was so crazy back then because I didn't really even have a title. I was going to be the lead programmer, but it was just Tom. But he was busy, so Alan said, just do the production reports. And I'm like, okay. I asked for a production assistant. He said, you don't need one. <laughs> and then we started doing we, we started doing design because there was no designer. So it's like, right. we're going to do it. And that was before it was – it wasn't post-apoc. That was when we had the little knight walking around on yeah, the grass. Yeah, on the grass. Yeah. Yeah, and I think early on you had said um, you wanted to do sci-fi, but we hadn't settled on a genre yet. So I just didn't want to do fantasy. Right. It was I felt like it had been done, and this was even before we got the D and D license. Yeah. Because we we were well underway when the D and D license arrived, and then we were told we were being canceled so that we could all get moved on to the D and D license. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it was we were just working on you were doing the world editor. And we were working on the first demo, right? Remember the the demo with the night and the rocks and the trees? We just were trying to put together something. Yeah, I remember basically him walking around. I, I don't remember when we got over that hump and had something that was like, felt real. I mean, because the, the night felt buildings. Like, <laughs> the and night basically felt like a tech demo. I was trying to, I was trying to make sure that the, uh, I could get sprites brought in because that was jason anderson when he started i remember he said what do you want me to do and i'm like i don't know because I, I, he goes well, what style is it and i'm like we don't have a setting i think we started those nightly session or those nighttime pizza things yeah but i just told him to render out a night and we'd work out how to import art because that was a we didn't have an art process yeah like that when you made frame maker art the frame the, that was it was a while before i don't know how long it was before i did that but yeah the, so the the first art utility i made was frame maker um which basically took a series of gifs that the artist had rendered i think they used maya i'm not sure um but it or would take they, a series i think they used alias or was i can't remember yeah in any case, um, it took a series of GIFs and then it mushed them together into the .frm format, which I believe you came up with, which was just compacted with not just the individual frames of animation, but then metadata like what the frame rate was and where the hotspot was to center the it in the hex. Right. And then offset per frame. <clears throat> so I think it, probably the walk cycle was the first thing that we did um so that was that was basically the job of frame maker initially is just to to take these series of gifts and turn them into a walk cycle in all six directions do you remember a big problem we had with that where it would get a little off and so when it got to the next it would reset and then we'd get a little off and it turned out yes. it had to do with perspective oh i didn't remember that that was the reason we, but I and we couldn't turn it off they didn't have orthographic projection as part of the threes so jason anderson solved it by pulling the camera back to infinity oh and then and zooming he, in at almost infinite so it looked the same but perspective was removed to almost nothing it was the, it was the weirdest hackiest but that's where we were <laughs> yeah and and so with that tool, once it imported the thing, you could there was a or wait, I guess there was there was two parts of it. There was Frame Maker, which was just a command line tool, which took all the stuff and threw it into um, the .frm file, <clears throat> and then there was uh, Frame Player. I th actually I can check my notes to, to see. To load in the frames and play them using our engine. Yeah. Okay. So Framer was yeah. Framer was the creator and then frm play frame player i don't know um was the thing that you could view it with but also um you could tweak the offsets so it would play the animation over and over like the walk cycle and then you can use the arrow keys to say oh one pixel this way one pixel that way um and then so that's what it was originally used for um i believe but then we also had things like static objects and walls and that sort of thing and so those were more or less just single frames um, or they were like an animated you know thing that, that stayed in one hex but then had an animation on it um and then so that was just you know updating the offset um for that and that i think we had no sound no yeah no way of even deciding where sound should be played that all came later <laughs> 
but yeah. And, and they, I originally, oh, go ahead. Go I was going to say I, I originally wrote the um, those two utilities, and then there was call for doing some other things like um, often because we had a series of files, um, <laughs> the, like or oh, oh, I remember it was when um, whatever art program they were using to output the files, like they were um, one based. Uh, numbering, it would be like, you know, dog one, dog two, dog three, dog four, or yes. something like that. And we wanted to import them with zero base numbering. <laughs> it's like just a, a trivial problem. But when you have like 80 files for one animation, or, or you know, even more than that, I suppose, um, I ended up writing a, um, just a file utility that would uh, renumber all the files in a sequence. And it seems like a pretty trivial problem, <laughs> but it actually is pretty sophisticated because it's like, is it one based or is, is it zero based? Is it um, padded or not padded? And you know how much padding is in there? So based on the the, the first file name that existed, and then the the uh, the format that you specified after that, it would figure out what to do, and then it would, you know, that bring whole up process all. got so complicated because there were so many one off utilities like that. Plus, we used Alchemy to get everything into the same color palette right and we had huge batch files that had to be run eventually they became overnight because there was just so much art to process um and then when the mac got involved they had to do their own processing and that's where i learned macs couldn't mac batch files couldn't do work on more than 256 files at a time huh so they had because this was the old mac os and they had to then Chris DeSavo had to do something so that it would do them in chunks. And it ran into the same problem of if you did a chunk and the chunk revolved, involved renaming things, then the next chunk had to remember where the previous chunk ended up. It was fun. <laughs> but you were one of the first people when we had those nightly meetings. You and I were the only ones who technically <laughs> were, were on the team with yeah. Jason. So Leonard came. Chris Taylor, Scott Campbell. Who else was in those meetings? I think Mark Harrison was there pretty early. I think so. Scotty may have come. Yeah. I know it was only about eight people because we had leftover pizza. That's the only reason I know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's where we, I mean, a lot of the early ideas came from those meetings. Yeah. Because I know you, you were talking about some things you remember, hey, we should do this and we should do this that I acknowledge like when we shipped, you know you're in the game credits as original design by. Yeah, I've got my Fallout manual here. Got all kinds of props. Yep, um, I think was it uh, original, original game design by Tim, Leonard, Jason, Chris, Jason, Scott. We, yeah. we, we made sure that went in there because my big worry was that you did so much work that was front loaded. Mm. And then you were gone and there were people who started on the project after you had left and they'd hear JT. But I don't think they knew who you were. And I, I remember we, Leonard and I were talking once because the manual was done really fast at the end. And mm. we're like, I think it's important. And I hope it doesn't insult people, but I think it's important that we put like, there was an original core group that came up with a lot of really important ideas. And I didn't want it to be lost later. It's weird that even back then I was thinking of in 10 years, are people going to know that we did this stuff? Because I didn't plan on working on Fallout 2. I, yeah. was, I wanted to do another original IP after that. But I know you were, in, I mean, the whole early stuff like vaults, what caused all the mutations, those were all things that, you contributed a lot of those original ideas to what we ended up doing and we shipped with them. Yeah. So where did you come up with those ideas? from? Well, I mean, I think it was just um, a natural part of that design process of just people throwing ideas at each other. Um, like, um, let's see, I put my notes in here that I uh, mentioned earlier, um, like the FEV, the forced evolutionary virus, um, I'm pretty sure, well, I know that I coined that term, 
Um, I th I think it might have been Scott Campbell or somebody else, or maybe it was you that suggested that, like we, we're trying to figure out why why are the mutations? You know, what's the, what's the explanation for the mutations? And like the obvious answer is, oh, radiation did it, whatever. But it, it was I think Scott that wanted to do something different, and he may have suggested, oh, maybe it's a virus, not radiation. I like that because it explains some of them, but yeah. now I think they've retconned it. So like everything's FEV, but yeah, I, yeah. I kind of liked like rat scorpions were just big scorpions because they got radiated. But yeah, so when when he or whoever came up with the idea that it might be viruses, I, I was immediately brainstorming and I thought, oh, what if it was an engineered virus and it wasn't a bad thing? It was like scientists trying to cure disease or, you know, whatever the it, it was some sort of experiment gone wrong. Um, and then that's where forced evolutionary virus came in. It was like supposed to be a beneficial thing for humans. Um, and I'll tell you why that's brilliant, because that idea was brilliant. Mm. Because making things radiation was like, okay, bad bombs. Making it FEV meant later on when we put the lab in, in the glow, it was like, here are the words where they made it. That's why it got nuked. Yeah. Because they wouldn't stop working on it. And it, it suddenly gave us like some bad guys and some place to focus on. I think the master came, stemmed from that. Like somebody went in there, actually several people went in there because the master was <laughs> a collection of individuals and a computer that was lying around. But <laughs> it, it, it gave us a focus of, and what I love about it, and this is true for a lot of Fallout, I don't think anybody was thinking that. Like when you thought of it, you weren't like, yes, I believe this will help focus the end game. <laughs> it was it was one of those things that afterwards we all went, wow, that idea was brilliant. I'm so glad you had it. I'm so glad <laughs> it, it was thought of and we did it because it helped us later in ways we never imagined that we would have needed. So that was that was a great idea. Um, we named the whole project Project Vault 13. Yeah, I had people ask me where it came from. So what made you think of that? Well, I, I think by the time I suggested Vault 13 for the name, we had already decided, well, we definitely decided we were post-apocalyptic. Um, you had already um, said you wanted the setting to be, or to start inside a, you know, an old bomb shelter or whatever. And I don't remember if you came up with the term Vault or somebody else did. It might've been me. I don't think so. Um, but just, I would... I was trying to think of a name that wasn't too, um, what's the word for it? Wasn't too descriptive about what the setting was, um, but sounded kind of mysterious. And of course, 13 is just always a cool number. So I was like, oh, Vault 13 sounds so mysterious. Everybody loved it. I think it was when, and I think it might've been me later, I went, what would the sequel be? Vault 13 yeah. 2, <laughs> Vault 14, more Vault 13. Yeah, so so the the name definitely disqualified itself in terms of yeah, sequel or probably any number of things. Um, but I think that like at the time I suggested that, I don't know that we had decided that the vaults would have numbers. It was just like you're in a vault, and yeah. then me having suggested Vault Thirteen, that became where we started, and then there must be more that developed to the story being oh there's there's a Vault Fifteen and there's a Vault whatever. Again, what, I remember explaining this to a journalist years later because he was so excited about all the ideas in Fallout. And every time I seemed to answer one of his questions, I'm like, well, so-and-so thought of this. I don't think it was going to, I don't think it meant anything, but then it became instrumental to, oh, later realize, well, if there's Vault 13, then there must be one through 12, and there's probably some past 13. And, and he was very disappointed that these weren't all like well-structured, planned, part of a much bigger storyline and setting. And it was yeah. just us going. <laughs> he was very discouraged by by those that, that the revealing of that. Yeah. But we changed the name of the uh, the executable. I think that night got changed to put out Vault thirteen v Vault thirteen dot exe. Yeah. And that was our executable for the longest time. Yeah, and I remember you said I think in your your talk at GDC, um, you said that like until the end, or maybe even the shift, like. <laughs> the installer installed Vault 13 and then renamed it to Fallout.exe after it <laughs> copied it over. It's um, yeah, it was so funny. It was stuff that's left over when people do 
they call it archaeological. They dig into the CD-ROM, and I'm like, archaeological? Was it? This isn't Babylonian. It's it's a CD-ROM from the 90s. But they say, like, they find the demo. Um, they found the recipe in Stone Keep for the pumpkin muffins because it was mm-hmm. just something for people to find. And the demo, the night demo, is on the Fallout CD for just people to find. Oh, I didn't know that. They took it out. Um, it's not in later versions. It it might not be in the, the two-pack jewel case, but I know it's not in the Bethesda ones anymore. Yeah. Was it's it just in the DOS version? Maybe? No, it was on the CD because it was the same CD whether you had Windows or DOS. It just installed a different executable and renamed it. Oh, okay. <laughs> we were so low tech. I mean, it was like the last line of the batch file was, oh, and rename it. <laughs> it, it was so, it's it, nothing had changed from when you did those text to voice things for Star Trek. It was very. Right. We just, it was like, how can we make this work so I can go do the other thousand things that have to be done? Yeah, and I think I think I came up with the idea of the character, or everybody in the vault having jumpsuits rather than regular clothes. I think you did too. Um, it wasn't even decided what they would look like. Leonard put that off for a long time until I threatened to take the blues out of the palette, but... Until then, didn't the guy come out looking like? Was he in his underwear? What was? What did he look like? For the longest time, he had no vault suit. He looked different. Yeah, I don't remember what the original guy looked like, but I remember when the the um, the vault suit guy was like when we when it was first shown to us, and when there was the big thirteen on the back. Yeah. <laughs> I really. Uh, I felt a sense of pride <laughs> when that came out. I remember telling Leonard, now this has to be the lowest level. So if you take off all your armor, this is what you see. So is this underwear? And he was like, okay, yeah. And then I said, later on, I'm like, I don't want these to be fabric. I want them to be extruded from a machine. Like a, like, like soft ice cream. You pull a lever and out, <clears throat> use a jumpsuit. Yeah, That was my um, entire contribution. Every time I hear the word extruded, I think of you. Because not only not only um, were the the jumpsuits extruded, but um, you were clear that in the the vaults the food was extruded as well. It was a big rule. Yeah, and that came from when we were doing uh, tabletop groups. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, you ran a sci-fi. Uh, I don't think it was a one shot. Maybe we did a couple sessions, but um, that was another. I remember previously when we were doing the the paper and pencil GURPS thing, part part of the the set dressing for that was the ship that we were on just had a food extruder rather than like a replicator. It was, it was like super high tech, but it was just extruded food. So yeah, I always think of you. I, I tend to have one idea and then I just stick with it. <laughs> food extrusion was wave of the future, but it's interesting how so many of these things just, they stick with us. like. Um, this is why I like talking to different people because you remember different things that once you said that, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember playing that because my memory of GURPS was these Conan campaigns that were very antagonistic. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Spencer got left behind. Then I did. we did a, a GURPS everything where I said you can use any book you want and Chris Taylor wanted to be psionic and I'm like, okay, you're psionic. Um, and it was very fun, but it was also very hard to GM those, which yeah. made me go, when we're talking about Fallout, I remember thinking, we have a lot of systemic roles, and the players are going to be able to do a lot of things and get away with a lot of things. Are we all okay with it? I was okay. I loved it. I loved it. There were like 13 ways of of saving Tandy from the, the, the cons when they kidnap her, including mm-hmm. ways we never planned on. But I know it made some people on the team nervous that there were so many systemic solutions to things. Yeah. I don't think you were one of the nervous people though. Like No, I mean I I really like the idea of like we we laid down that principle pretty early that every quest in the game would have more than one solution. You wouldn't only be able to do it if you're strong or if you've got good gun skill or good talking or whatever. Like everything was designed around having multiple solutions. And, you know, from an RPG background, I thought that was really great because it gives the player, a, you know, a chance to be creative and do different builds. And there's not just like one optimal way to play the game. 
I don't know if it's true that in the end, every quest <laughs> had multiple solutions, but the main um, quest did. We we, yeah. we we told QA, and part of that was a fallback because I was like, I'm really worried that if someone makes a character that they can't finish the game. Yet. And I remember uh, head of QA was like, well, I can't test every, everything on everything. And I'm like, well, just make sure the main quests are always something people can get through with wildly different variants. Yeah. Do you remember? Um, you really got into GURPS, and that's what I loved. You would like dig down in it. Yeah. And the March email, March '95 email, you sent me called the Spear Problem. Yeah, I do remember that. Um, if you have the email, I would love for you to read it. I do have the email because I I don't have a copy of it. I remember that being a thing though. I keep everything. It's literally called. The Spear Problem by JT. And you said, I was creating a character that relied on a spear as a primary weapon. I gave the character a spell, spear skill of 17 so that he would have a staff default of 15 so that he'd have a staff parry of 10. I considered giving him a quarter staff and a spear, but then I remembered on page two, no, I remembered a reference on page 133 in a sidebar that stated, and I quote, a headless spear is a quarter staff. If they're the same, I thought, then why can't I use a spear to parry like a quarter staff and get my two thirds parry? Skill parry. <laughs> then I realized there was more to it because spears can be used one-handed or two-handed, but quarter staffs are only two-handed, and spe spear users have to take a, a turn to switch their grip. And staffs are always one or two hex range, but spears are always two hex unless they change their grip, and then it can be used one. And I was like, <laughs> I remember thinking, A, I love this guy. <laughs> two, wow. And then the email has references. You you like you supported your conclusion of well on page fifty two here's what it says about spear and then here's what it says about staff here's what it says about two handed swords here's the sidebar here's a chart <laughs> and then you had a list of conclusions and it was awesome because you wanted to make sure that the game we made a grips game yeah you wanted to be able to do that especially if we had let, let, let weapons break like the spear broke now a quarter staff yeah. Or possibly a club. <laughs> it might be a club if it breaks in the middle rather than up where the spear point is. I right. mean, that's how detailed you were. And I remember, I remember thinking of you as, oh, I'm so glad because we're going to make GURPS and I want it to be right. And I want Steve Jackson to love it. Although we were talking earlier before we started talking, we, I mean, we, met, we were talking about Floyd Grubb. Do you remember when Steve Jackson came and we all played uh, Illuminati? No, that might have been after my time. Oh, okay. Floyd played and he did a he did a weird card thing and Steve said you can't do that and Floyd went oh yes I can and he pulled out the rule book and he pointed to a rule and Steve looked at the rule book looked at Floyd and looked at the rule book and glanced <laughs> at me and went you're right that's legal and I was sitting there going oh, it hurts. <laughs> pull it back <laughs> but Steve was, he laughed and it was funny. And then Floyd won. Of course. And everybody laughed. But I just remember thinking it was so funny. We had so many people there that were into so many Steve Jackson games, not just girls. And I think that effect, Steve Jackson was like, people are really my kind of peeps. And when you told me you were leaving, I remember the first thing I thought was, shoot i'm losing like somebody who likes to dig into gerps like i do somebody who'll make sure that i don't mess up that steve jackson will see everything and go oh good you got the the skill defaults and all the special extra rules that associated with different weapon types you got all that working but um do you want to talk about when you decided to yeah let, let me wrap up on the spear thing uh, okay. first though <clears throat> so um Part of the reason that I love GURP so much is because it, um, unlike D and D, which I also loved, and you know that was my background prior to that, um, it gives you that flexibility. You're not just a fighter. You know, you can be a fighter, but you're specializing in spear, and you've got agility or whatever the case is. Yeah. Um, and so, like with this spear problem, I, I really wanted to make it right. I didn't want it to just be like feel like another fantasy D and D game where it just 
it doesn't matter that we have GURPS rules because everything's generic or, you know, whatever. Um, so I cared about that. And one thing I don't remember if uh, you remember this, but after that email, we talked about it. And one of the, the end results of that was we got we had to email Steve Jackson games. I forget, like Sean something, I think was like the you had the the rule changes. Yeah, he was like the in charge of the errata for GURPS or something like that. Yeah. So I think you ended up setting me up with his email and I emailed him to say, here's the problem. Am I correct about this, that or the other? And I think he basically said, yeah, this, that all sounds right. Um, yeah. So we got the blessing on it. Well, I love that because earlier, before I even started doing GURPS, when I was just playing around with it in grad school, I made a combat simulator. And I discovered that agility was way better than strength. Oh, I saw your episode on that. Yeah, and um, he didn't like that. He was like, "Your your 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 simulator's wrong." And I'm like, "It's good." And he goes, "Did you take account armor? Mm -hmm. Did you take account when you get hit, your skills are penalized the next round?" Mm -hmm. It was all taken account of. It just agility you know, is OP. It is. It's pretty. And you know what? It kind of was OP in Fallout. <laughs> it's OP in a lot of games. Um, yeah. But yeah, and they I think they accepted they accepted those changes for us. Do you know if later versions of GURPS switched to it? I don't know. I think they might have because your your rule changes were written up as like official GURPSES. You wrote it in their language. I still have it. You have all here's what I want Spear to be, here's what I want staff to be in two handed. And you even rewrote the sidebar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Oh, I said, I'll forward this to you. It is awesome. It is. That's great. I just remember going, oh, phew. JT's going to watch our our minutia and make sure we don't stray from yeah. the core of GURPS. Um, All right. So when I left, so the time frame is I started at Interplay in uh, December of 92. And that's, you know, as we talked about earlier, I started in QA. I forget at what point I started actually working on games as opposed to, you know, customer support or uh, QA. And you you have the dates better than me as far as like when Fallout started. Uh, in any case, um, I loved the team. I loved the game. I didn't have a sense of this is going to be the next big thing. And, you know, being new to the game industry, it's like I had no perspective on any of that. Um, but I was... Um, I was going to college still. I think I was 21 when I started at Interplay. So anyway, early 20s, still going to college. And, um, you know, I was poor. <laughs> so I worked part time. I went to, to uh, community college uh, part time and it was slow going. And at one point, um, I kind of got to the realization, or at least I felt it was a realization that if I was going to stay in computer games, um, I needed to have a programming degree. I needed to have a computer science degree. I'm curious where you got that idea, because like Jay Patel, the tech director, didn't have a degree, and he was a phenomenal programmer. Right, and and actually, I I had a conversation with him about it, and and essentially that, that's what he said. He said, well, you know, you don't have to have a degree; you just have to you know know how to code and whatever. And I thought, well, it, it was it wasn't entirely convincing, <laughs> or you know, I felt like um, there was a, a guy, um, Phil Britt, I think. Yes. You remember Phil? Yeah, I didn't we, know we worked at Barstow Construction Set. Yeah, but but he, um, if I'm remembering the name right. Um, he also was like a database programmer or something. I've been. I forget. He did graphics for for the game we were on. He was the graphics guy. Mm, okay. In any case, there were, and maybe it wasn't Phil, but there was somebody that also did database stuff, which you know was new to me and whatever at the time. But he, I think he left Interplay and got a job paying like twice as much. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And, and that was a reflection of, in general, um, the game industry doesn't pay as much as other industries. And that's still true today, although I think less so than back then. Back then it was like criminal, right? <laughs> um, and that that was going through my mind at the time of like, well, 
the only place I can work is here because if I try to go somewhere else, I'll, I'll have like game credits, but like how many other game companies are there and are they gonna, it, it, are my, is my skill set going to transfer? Um, but then I thought, well, if I have a computer science degree, then I've got that credibility. And plus if I get out of games and go into something else like databases, um, I've got options. I'm not just specialized into one thing. It's interesting. So, I, I don't remember us talking about that because, ironically, I almost didn't get hired at Interplay because they said, well, you have a master's degree in computer science. You're overqualified, and we don't think you're stick around here. We look sometimes look for people who don't have degrees. And I was like – That's funny. But that was in 91, so maybe by yeah. 95 things had changed. Yeah. Well, I guess it's fair to say that there were mixed messages from people in terms of – that's a fair you, way of putting it. Yeah, but at least my personal conclusion was my long-term success depends on me finishing school. It's like I'm not going to drop out of school, and I'm not going <laughs> to, you know, keep doing this part-time thing forever. Uh, and you know, it's like I'm half in a job and half in school, and it just felt not great. Um, and then also, um, I was married, a, a marriage that fell apart. But, you know, I was uh, young, uh, and I, I married the wrong person too soon, <laughs> right? And um, her job got transferred. She was working in, like, Orange or something like that. And uh, basically, that office was shutting down, and they were opening up a new office in Northern California. And she wanted to move and get a promotion. And and even she was like a – I think – a secretary at the time when she was getting a promotion to office manager. But even as a secretary, she made more money than I did. <laughs> right. Yeah. A, now I remember you were, there was a move involved. Yeah. And so like in, in hindsight, if I wasn't married, if we were just still even engaged and, you know, the relationship wasn't that great. Um, obviously we got divorced eventually. Um, but a better decision would have been to break up and stay at Interplay. I mean, I can say that in hindsight. I, I like I don't like to regret things in life, but that's like a thing I can look back and say that was clearly the wrong decision. Well, I can tell you that a lot of people on the project, including me, were like, oh, shoot. Because you were not only there from, from everyone else's point of view, you were always there. And you were yeah. the one people went to to ask a lot of questions like, hey, this isn't working. Or do you know how this is supposed to work? I, I see this thing in the group. We all have the basic set. <laughs> Yeah, I see what what's written here. This is what I'm seeing in the game. Um, I just want to go on record since we're recording this that it had nothing to do with me playing Apex Twin constantly <laughs> in the office. No, we we crossed that bridge. We we got over that. Yeah. Okay, because I did play an awful lot of ambient music. <laughs> we were right outside, even though we got moved into an office. We were right outside that big pit area. Yeah, there was a lot of noise in there. Well, in the the door, the second floor entrance was right next to us, and the the uh, push bar was like real squeaky, <laughs> and people would like slam it, and like, slam squeak. And, and from the other side was where the fax machine was, so there was a constant yeah. noise, and we were both trying to code. Yeah, and we were soothed by the dulcet, piercing tones of Ventolin <laughs> and other Apex Twin tracks. Exactly. Okay, that's how I remember it, and that's how I'm going to state it from now on. Been yeah, so so the, the the summary or the short answer of why I left is I wanted to finish my degree. Uh, my wife at the time had a job move, and I decided we would move, and I would go back to school full-time and finish my degree and then go from there. And uh, then you which, did, and you went to work for a number of game companies, I yeah, um, immediately after graduating from Sacramento State University, um, I got a job at Hewlett Packard, uh, which was in Roseville, where I lived. <laughs> so it was basically 10 minutes away. And um, it was like a real big boy company. You know, it's like... A <laughs> you wear ties? <laughs> no, I did not. Okay. Uh, polo shirts. Um, but uh, yeah, it was like real industry, Silicon Valley, prestigious, whatever. And I, my starting salary, I think was around $50,000, which was like twice as much that I was getting paid at Interplay. That's what I got. I had to beg for that in order to qualify for a mortgage several, after you left. Yeah. 
No, um, I was before you left. Or no, 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 because I've I've been to your house. Yeah, you had I, like a housewarming or something. Did you know that I threatened to leave over not being able to qualify for that mortgage? I think that you had told me that before because I, I saw that your video on that and yeah. it sounded familiar. Yeah, I remember I was just upset because I had this mortgage guy go, you're paid so little. I had somebody in here last week who was a programmer with less experience. He got double your pay. I'm sitting there just like, yeah, what's happening? I'm being, <laughs> I'm being made to feel bad by this mortgage guy. <laughs> but yeah, that's right. You came to the housewarming party in October. I remember. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, you work I got at a HP. job, I got a job at HP, um, uh, doing firmware for, uh, Unix servers. Um, so it was a combination of C and assembly language, PA risk assembly, which is a, a weird beast. I mean, not that I had really, uh, picked up much of that 68,000 assembly language, but PA risk was weird. There, um, just like the only thing I remember from it is um, so part of the, you, you probably know this, but other you know people watching just for some com com computer science background. Um, oh, geez, my phone pad. Thanks. I put up uh, some noise canceling foam up there. Um, anyway, so like a, a regular like Intel processor is a CISC rather than RISC. I, what does that stand for? Complicate or Complicated Complex instruction? instruction set. Complex instruction set. And then yeah. you used a reduced instruction set. Yeah. And the idea with the reduced instruction set is, is you're optimizing for all the instructions having the same byte length. So you don't have like, you know, eight byte and four byte and two byte and one byte instructions because you have to do all this extra work and yeah. you don't know how long it's going to take for the instruction to finish or whatever. So PA risk is optimized so that every uh, instruction is exactly the same length. They, it, execute in the exact same time and you, you get to pipeline them through and it allows for all these optimizations. So one of the um, uh, side effects of it is if you're looking at assembly code and there's a, a branch in it, you know, like if condition branch to here, otherwise do this. Well, <laughs> you were pipelining so hard that even if you took the branch, you still executed the next instruction. <laughs> you could have both sections in the pipeline already done. Yeah, so, uh, so, so like <laughs> looking at the code, you have to know that, oh yeah, I took the branch, but in a minute, I'm gonna do this next thing first. And then whether you took the branch or not, you always executed it, whatever. So you didn't have to and, do that branch prediction stuff that became a big deal later, I think in risk architecture. Yeah, um, but anyway, so I, I worked for about three years at uh, HP uh, and then got laid off, uh, the, which was, I think that, yeah, that was the first time I was ever laid off and that was terrible. Um, but it was also the first time that um, HP ever had layoffs. So this was like 2001, I think. Yeah, they had a new CEO come in, uh, Carly Fiorina. And then after about a year, um, or maybe it was, she was, had been there two years, it was like layoffs. So that was not cool. Is that when you got back into games? Uh, that was the impetus. So. Um, because of that layoff, um, I was unemployed for, I don't know, a year or two. I had done some like contract stuff. Um, but then I got back into games. Um, I hooked up with um, Scott Matthews, who I knew from Interplay, um, and then ended up getting a job with him at Fluid Entertainment. So th this is um, kind of a weird happenstance. Um, you remember D&D 3rd Edition? It was like a big deal. And um, part of, or, or one of the things with the um, the new book is uh, on the back cover had a CD-ROM and it had a third edition character creator. And it was just called the D&D character creator or whatever. Uh, so I, I got third edition. I was, you know, definitely um, highly anticipating it. Um, and I, you know, got the character generator, started using it. And then I was looking at the credits and I saw, you know, buy fluid entertainment, blah, blah, blah. And then I see Scott Matthews uh, as like CEO or whatever producer. And I was like, wait a minute, Scott Matthews from Interplay, who I used to play magic with. <laughs> um, and I was unemployed at the time, right? And uh, I, so I, I ended up uh, getting in contact with him. I don't know how I found him. 
uh, but it, we just you know caught up and at some point um, I visited him at his office. And that was and, up north too, right? Is yeah, he was. Uh, he had an office in Mill Valley. Okay. And um, they had they were working on like a PS2 game or something like that. But in any case, um, he and you know he knew that I obviously played D and D and other RPGs and that kind of thing. And he he said, yeah, we so we made the character creator, and but we're going to do a follow up product called Master Tools, which is going to be a map editor. It's going to be you know character better character creator, do more stuff. Uh, and we're not hiring for it right now, but when we are, I'm, I'm going to keep you in mind for that. And I was like, amazing. And eventually, like contract negotiations with Wizards fell through and the product never got off the ground. I, th I think they may, may, maybe even started making it and then they canceled the project or something like that. Um, so that fell through. Um, but then, you know, he still had me in mind and then he was doing another product and he needed some web development stuff done. So I went and I did web development for him. Um, and then eventually they got another game and I started doing game design and coding, whatever. And then I was definitely in at that point and then stayed in games from then on. Because I saw some of you, the list of what you worked in. You worked at EA at one point too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like... Twice. <clears throat> Actually, I, I work at EA right now, um, but I had worked at EA and gotten laid off. <laughs> Second time I got laid off. Yeah, so the, the timeline was uh, worked at Fluid. Um, the company eventually went out of business. Um, I worked at a startup in San Francisco called The Broth that was doing Facebook games. Um, left there, went to EA for about three years. Um, the project that I was working on got canceled. I got laid off. <laughs> then I went to a company called Kixeye um, back in San Francisco. Um, they did Facebook games, uh, most famously Battle Pirates and War Commander Rogue Assault. Actually, sorry, Rogue Assault was a... Um, a mobile version of War Commander. I didn't work on it. I didn't work on the, the uh, Facebook game or, or the fast flash based Facebook game. I worked on the uh, the mobile one. <clears throat> Did Kixi for about four years and then um, got a job at EA where I am now uh, and at their office uh, in Sacramento called Capital Games. Um, and I've worked on uh, Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, uh, which is the uh, most profitable Star Wars game in history on any platform. Wow. Uh, and then um, we recently, I, I worked on um, uh, the Lord of the Rings Heroes of Middle Earth, uh, which just shipped in um, May. Um, and then I've moved on to another project since then. What's your role on those? So on um, wh when I got on to Galaxy of Heroes, um, I took over as um, lead client engineer which sounds more important than it is because like the game was had been out <laughs> right it, it was a matter of steering the ship not like inventing anything that's right? important well ships sure. hit sandbars all the time <laughs> that's true um yeah so i was a lead client engineer for almost two years on that um and then they were spinning up a new game uh, the lord of the rings game um and i moved over to that project and uh, me and one other guy uh, I was the lead client engineer. He was the lead server engineer. <clears throat> and basically, we knew we wanted to do a new game, a fantasy game, probably Lord of the Rings, maybe D&D. We didn't know at the time. But we wanted to um, update the, or basically fork the Galaxy of Heroes code base and get it set up for another game. Because, you know, with any code base, you always start to code specific things in there, right? It's not just a generic thing you can reskin. Um, and then there were a lot of tech improvements we wanted to make. So for about nine months, we basically just refactored the game uh, to make it ready for development. And then finally, we got the, the Lord of the Rings license, um, staffed up a team and whatnot. <clears throat> and then at that point, I wasn't lead engineer. I was just uh, a senior engineer uh, and then worked on that for about another two years um, until we shipped it. Did you ever work with any other Interplay people? Because I know I crossed paths with people. Um, let me think about that. Besides Scott Matthews and sort of indirectly with Chip Bumgarner on a project that Fluid was working on, I don't think I worked with any other follow uh, or sorry, any other interplay people at all. 
Because uh-huh. I would just tell people I used I just kept running into Interplay people. Because Interplay got up to um when I left in ninety eight, it was at six hundred people. Do you remember wow. what it was like when you left in ninety five? Was it like two hundred? It was like four hundred. Four hundred. Yeah, when I started it was about one twenty. Um and then I remember switching buildings and got up to about four hundred about the time. Did I you left. start at Fitch? Yeah. And then you left when we went to Alton, and then it moved Von Karman. Yes, I don't. I remember both of those names or those street names just from being in Irvine. I don't remember which office was which though. Yeah, I was, you weren't at Susan because we moved there in ninety. But yeah, yeah, that was interesting. That was a. Um, I just because it it, it it really got so big and then reduced in size considerably the i just kept everywhere i went i would run into at least one or two like uh i've run into bill dugan a few times um Scott yeah I've seen, yeah i've seen people at like gdc uh but like in a professional capacity i, I can't remember anybody from interplay that i've run into i just find it interesting when you after you've been in the industry long enough you tend to run into people a lot but i i love that so many people at Interplay started at um, a game store. Chris Taylor did as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Scotty. Scotty got several people there from his store. Um, oh, yeah, Kirk, Kirk Tomei. Yeah. Because um, Kirk started at um, Egghead, I think, maybe like a month after I did. And that's where we became friends. And then, yeah, after after I switched or sorry, after I got a job at Interplay, I think a couple months later, he got a job. Um, I think, oh yeah, he's, he went into customer service as well. Oh man, <laughs> I love Kirk. There was, um, he would get, okay, so customer services, as you might imagine, a super frustrating job, right? Very high customer stress. Customer facing, uh, yes. Um, it, but he would get so frustrated. Um, we uh, we used to have these Plantronic headsets and the, you know this little thing and um, the microphone was like just this little it's almost like a straw it was like literally a tube right and a characteristic of it is if you put your finger over the end of the tube it would just like basically mute it it was like a manual mute it was not designed to do that right <laughs> but I remember this one day uh, Kirk was talking to a customer and he was like being very calm talking to the customer yes uh type c colon backslash or you know just like very robotic and he goes that's right and then he covers the microphone and it says just like i fucking told you and then he unmutes it and then goes back into the calm voice uh, it was uh, and i think he so he did that occasionally and i think there was a, a time when he did not mute properly and um then that was bad <laughs> but with when I first started, I seem to remember that customer service and QA were about the same, were the same thing. They like people, you'd play games, and then if a call came in, you had to help the customer, and then you went back to playing games. The, that there might have been some truth to that. When I started in QA, it was in the Fitch building on the second floor. The QA office was like, I think it was literally four people. The big was, room in the back. The window. Well. It was it was where we kept um, spare manuals and and extra discs of games and stuff. So people were coming in and and out had nothing to do with you guys, yeah. Yeah, it was basically a, a glorified storage closet. But um, Carrie Garrison was the director of QA or or sorry, not QA, director of customer service. I don't know. Uh, there was uh, Stephanie. Um, she was more like a secretary. I don't know. I don't remember exactly what her role was. She didn't answer the phones. Um, oh, she she might have been in charge of like mailing stuff out, like replacement discs and that sort of thing. There was me. There was Tig, which I forget his real name, and then maybe like one other person. So it was like it was a, like, packed in a little thing. I don't remember us playing games at all. It, but maybe that was before my time. But at some point, not too long after, uh, we moved downstairs into a bigger office so we could hire more people. And then QA was definitely on the top floor on the far side. And that was quite a bit bigger. There was like 
computers all around. Um, I remember when you guys were on the second floor because I was also on the second floor, and sometimes people would run down and go, "Hey, someone just called in about rags to riches, and I don't know how to answer." And I'd be like, "I'll try to remember what that problem was." But I remember somebody named Tig because I wrote Ganal, and then when I rewrote Ganal, I called it Tig. And somebody on the team said, is that based on that TIG? No. And then years later, when I told the story, somebody thought I was talking about TIG Nataro, the comedian. I'm like, oh. no, I'm not talking about her either. It's it's a little piece of software. It's not a person. <laughs> but it, yeah, who knew TIG was such a popular name? Yeah. But I remember um, your office, let's see, I think in the, the time frame when I was in QA, uh, your office, I think, was not too far from there. Um, and you know, everybody, everybody that had an office had their name plates or whatever you could custom put the characters in. It was like the, you know, the, the $5, uh, uh, Very high office tech. Depot thing. Yeah. And I, I think that yours changed occasionally. I can't remember for sure, but I do remember at one point, um, your title was AI and assorted sophistry. <laughs> Chris DeSavo learned that Tim Kaine could be rearranged to say I'm antic. <laughs> so yeah people had fun with that <laughs> yeah um i think it was that i think i shared that also with mark harrison oh that could be but, but it, it wasn't that eventually the same office that i joined you in one down okay we moved one down mark stayed there i moved one down you moved in with me someone else moved in with mark that drove mark completely insane i won't say his name but he drove mark insane and mark uh almost became physically violent one day <laughs> and had to leave the building <laughs> because the person claimed to have invented a perpetual motion machine and mark had a degree in physics and he just walked out of it he was like i i have to leave here i i have to get out of this building <laughs> <laughs> i was like Ooh. I mean, I actually thought Rusty Buchert was the individual I was actually going to witness exploding into pieces. Yeah. But that day it was Mark Harrison. So, um, good times. That's well, funny. I'm so glad we got to talk about this because there are things that, like, every time I talk to someone, it's a different perspective on what was going on on the game and at Interplay. And I remember most of this, but not all of it. And it's just, it's great because it makes me think, okay, I, I'm not insane. Things were like what I thought they were. But I can tell you that when I remembered you were leaving, I just remember you had a good reason and everybody was sad. So I hope, I hope you knew that because it was, uh, I think, when you left, we were all kind of bummed. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely picked up that people didn't want me to leave. I don't know that I ever like totally internalized that like everybody was real sad when so. artists would come to me and say they were sad i'm like okay this is <laughs> this gone beyond programming and design um but they were and people said to me later like that was a huge blow when we would talk about what were the big road blocks for fallout and we talk about the D, &D license almost getting us canceled or we talk about the whole GURPS thing People will always go, oh, and we lost JT. So I hope you know that, and it's up there as one of the things that we we had to recover from. Mm. But I think you did, I think it was the right choice for you. And, you know, you went on to do good things, and you got back in the game industry, as everybody yeah. knew you would. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe I had worked a year and a half on Fallout before I left. Well, sorry, I only worked on GURPS <laughs> because yes. it wasn't Fallout until after I left. It was called Vault 13 before you left, but yeah, yeah, it was it was way before we had thought of the name. That happened, I think I said it, it happened in 96. Um, at least we didn't go with my name, Brad Storm. <laughs> That's terrible. I was pulled back. It's, everybody was like, no, just forget you ever said that. But <laughs> anyway, I appreciate you talking, and I hope everybody who watches this got a good extra insight into very, very early Fallout development. Thank you, JT. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to be here.